So uh, the first announcement is assignment four is up and it is due next Friday around midnight. So I guess you have ample time to work on this assignment. It is based on what we have done in the class so far. And uh, the other announcement is that spring break is on Feb 23, 24. So there will be no classes on Feb 24th, which is a Wednesday. And, uh, and yeah, I just wanted to make sure that you all know that. Um, let's jump right into the uh, into today's lecture. So we were talking about discrete time. Fourier trans uh, Fourier series. The Fourier series for discrete time system. And if you remember the synthesis equation, for the discrete time Fourier series is k equals zero to n minus one a k e raised to j k omega naught n and the analysis equation is a k Is a capital N the the period or the fundamental yeah. period? The fundamental period. Okay, thank you. Sure. Actually, another question. Yeah. yeah. Is there a big difference between a function's period and its fundamental period, or should they be the same thing? Uh, so you know, uh, so fundamental period is the smallest period. Um, so there is a difference. So you could have oh, okay. you you have like sine omega naught sine 2 pi t and so the period for this particular signal is uh, capital T equals to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on because all of these are periods, possible periods because sine 2 pi t plus 5 equals to sine 2 pi t. So 5 is a period for yeah. sine 2 pi t, but the fundamental period is the smallest number, which is one. So would we say that the fundamental period is one or would we say that it's two pi? Because if the fundamental period is, if, if t is one, then would, so we say it, it, the fundamental period is one, okay. Yeah, yeah, fundamental period is one. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so AKs are called spectral coefficient or Fourier series coefficient. Okay, so this is synthesis equation. Uh, it allows you to recover the original signal if you know the Fourier series coefficients. And if you knew the omega naught, so which is the fun, uh, which comes from the fundamental period of the signal, and the analysis equation allows you to compute the spectral coefficients or Fourier series coefficients for if you are given a periodic signal with a given fundamental period capital N. Okay, I want to just make one minor comment here. Uh, 
which is about the summation. So typically, of course, I'm writing the summation k equals zero to n minus one or n equals zero to capital N minus one. Uh, but the way you, because these signals are periodic, you can pick any consecutive n terms for the summation. So what do I mean by that? Let's extend AK to to entire real line uh, to in the entire um, space of integers. So I'm going to define AK plus RN equals to AK for all R in Z, and of course N is the fundamental period. So I compute a zero to a n minus one, and then I extend that a zero to a n minus one to the entire set of integers. So from from a zero to a n minus one, we extend to get a minus. 500 is that ak plus rn or 2n yeah rn rn this is r where r is in z z is the set of integers so i'm i'm extending it all the way to a minus infinity a 499 a minus 1 a 0 a 1 a n minus 1 a 500 and so on. Okay, so I've extended this a zero to a n minus one to all the way from a minus infinity to a plus infinity by using this expression. So now a itself becomes a periodic signal, uh, but that's because we have actually made it periodic by just redefining the values of a minus 500, A minus 400, and so on. Now, the way we will write, or the way we can write the uh, analysis equation or synthesis equation, because everything is periodic. No? So now, because since AK and XN so this is how we write sequences. So AK and XN, they are all are periodic. We can write AK equals to one over N summation N equals to so notice this symbol, I'll make it in red. So I have, um, so I created a periodic values of AK by extending the definition of AK all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. Oh, I should basically write here Z not N. Uh, 
Um, so now I have like two periodic signals. So the spectral coefficients themselves form a periodic signal and Xn of course is a periodic signal. Uh, we can actually write the synthesis equation and the analysis equation by taking just the consecutive terms, uh, summation over consecutive values of N or in the case of Xn, I'm sorry, but when you say the consecutive values over n, are you saying like it's it since they're integers, it would be one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, or negative right. one, two, three, four, five? Yes. Okay. Thank yes. You. yes. So well, uh, negative one and then zero and then one, two, three, four, five. So it has to be consecutive, but in an increasing order, right? Increasing. Okay. Yeah. So here I'm going to write K equals N. So again, here I'm taking K N consecutive values of K for doing this summation. Now this whole thing is useful when you're doing computation by hand. And so sometimes taking uh, certain consecutive values will make your uh, problem much easier or make the computation much easier. And that's why we do this kind of uh, extension it, just for making our lives easier when we are doing the computation of AKs and XNs. Okay, let's look at uh, the rectangular waves and let's try to find the Fourier series coefficients for a rectangular wave in discrete time. Okay, any questions so far? Is this rectangular wave you're about to show us gonna be a good example of how we're using this process? Yes. Then that's all I need to know, thank you. Great. Okay, so let's look at a rectangular wave And so this is minus N1, this is N1. Well, I have to put zero somewhere. Zero, N1. and so on. So we have such uh, thing. So um, why is N1 and negative N1 uh, two spaces both away from zero instead of one space? Oh, um, N1 could be any value. N1 could be five, uh, six, two. So in this case, I'm just showing two, but uh, we'll do the computation for more general values of N1. So. It so what you're saying is, since they could be any value, it doesn't matter where we put them. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So this is a rectangular wave. Discrete time. Okay, so I have a periodic signal. The fundamental period is capital N and um, it's equal to one from minus N1 to plus N1 and then it becomes zero afterwards and then it becomes plus one after minus N1 plus capital N and so on. This is this, this this thing just continues, okay? So this is a periodic wave. 
and therefore because it's periodic therefore it will have a fourier series expansion and the goal is to compute ak I'm sorry, but I'm confused as to, I, I understand why it's N1 minus N because you're going to the negative. That part makes sense to me. Right. So you have to subtract, but why is on the positive side is the N1 a negative? That's confusing me. Right, so so this is minus N1 here, right? So it will right. start repeating itself after capital N time steps because the fundamental period is capital N. So this yes. is minus N1 plus capital N. This is uh, plus n of okay. this, this value, plus n of this value. You see, I, I should have known that from 2050. Thank you. Yeah. OK. So now the question is, how do we compute the values of AK? Well, we have the Fourier series. Uh, we, just, we just saw what the values how to compute the values of AK, we have to compute one over capital N. Now I can pick any N consecutive values. So I'll take N equals to minus N1 to N equals to minus N1 plus capital N minus one, E raised to minus JK to JK omega naught N xn so i'm just picking n consecutive values of uh, n consecutive values of small n so in this case, my n consecutive values is minus n1 minus n1 plus 1 minus n1 plus n minus 1. OK, let's go back to the picture. So we see that the value of xn is equal to 1 for minus n1, minus n1 plus 1, all the way to plus n1. And then after that, it becomes 0. So this is n1 plus 1, n1 plus 2. And this is n1 plus capital N minus n1 plus capital N minus 1. So until here, so from n1 plus 1 all the way to this particular value, the value of xn is 0. So I can actually uh, do the summation only between minus n1 to plus n1, because after that, the values are equal to 0. So this becomes equal to 1 over n. Summation n goes from minus n1 to plus n1, e raised to minus jk omega naught n. You're saying that just the x of n value is equal to that? So x so of n is equal to zero. Equal to the whole thing. Oh, okay. The whole thing. The whole thing. This whole thing becomes equal to one over capital N summation of n goes from minus n one to plus n one. Thank you. Sure. So now the question is, what's this value? equal to what do you think we can use something that you know of that we could use to evaluate this summation what should we do integrate well this is a summation so there's no integration involved here what else can we do Okay, let me rewrite it, okay? I'll wait for everyone to think about it. So I have written AK equals to one over capital N summation E raised to minus JK omega naught 
raised to n. Okay, so these two are the same. So how do we evaluate this sum? What is this equal to? So I just rewrote this e raised to minus j q omega naught n. So n is getting multiplied with this exponent. So I can just take it outside. It's equal to e raised to minus j q omega naught raised to n. Let me give you another hint. So let me call lambda equals to minus e raised to j k omega naught. And so I have one over n summation lambda raised to n. What can I do? Is it, <clears throat> would it become a geometric series then? Yeah, yeah. So it becomes a geometric series. And so we can use that expression to come to evaluate this geometric series. So let me write it minus n1 plus lambda raised to minus n1 plus 1 plus lambda raised to n1. I struggle with the geometric series. Could you maybe give a recap or a, a little summation for it of, of how we're supposed to identify it and solve it? Uh, so we have done it several times in the class so far. Uh, why don't we meet after this class, after the class gets over and then I can explain it to you. Thank you. Sure. So I see someone's written something in the chat. Oh, yeah. Yes, it is a geometric sum. Now, what is this sum equal to? Well, this is equal to one minus lambda raised to two n one plus one over one minus lambda. Okay, this comes from the geometric series stuff that you might have studied earlier. And those of you who don't recall this, just, just wait af after the class is over and then I'll go over how the derivation, where, where does this derivation comes from. Okay, so we had this ugly looking, so no, we had this ugly looking expression here and we wanted to compute this sum so we converted it using the fact that xn is equal to zero after for n greater than capital N1. So we use that information to uh, write this summation in this form, which looks somewhat manageable. Then we recognize that, oh, actually this sum is equivalent to writing this sum. And by just renaming something e raised to minus jq omega naught as lambda, we realize that it's just a geometric sum, geometric series sum. So that we know how to solve. So this is just a simplification so that I can get it in this particular format. And then once I get it in this format, I immediately recognize that this is given by this particular summation um, fraction. Now I can substitute lambda equals to e raised to jk omega naught. I need to substitute that. And after substitution and a bit of computation, you can show that AK is given by one over capital N sine 
2 pi k n1 plus 1 half over n over sine pi k over capital N. This is for k not equals to zero plus minus n and so on, plus minus two n. And a k, for k equals to zero, it's actually very simple. So I just substituted lambda equals to e raised to minus j omega naught, j k omega naught here, in order to get this expression when k is not equal to zero or plus minus n or plus minus two n. I get it in this form. When k equals to zero plus n or plus minus two n and so on, a k can be just written by, I mean, the expression is pretty easy. Um, oh. So this relationship holds only when lambda is not equal to one. So when k is equal to zero, then lambda is equal to one. So I can easily compute what this value is and that's what that's what I get. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Uh, I was, uh, my internet died for like five minutes. These are oh. the spectral coefficients for the- uh, Square wave. Square wave, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, the rectangular wave or whatever square wave that we were considering here. Okay, so let's let's go back because your internet died. Let's let's go back. So we had this AK can be computed in this fashion. So we converted it into uh, the sum of geometric series right here. And and by doing some manipulation, uh, we arrived at this particular equation. Uh, we recognize how to compute this geometric sum. So when lambda is not equal to one, I can write it in this form. When lambda is equal to one, I can just substitute lambda equals to one and get it in the right, uh, get, get the value as two n one over capital, two n one plus one over capital N. And when lambda is not equal to one, which is the case when K is not equal to zero, not equal to plus minus N, not equal to plus minus two N, I get the simplified format, which is in this fashion. So now I have I have the geometric uh, I have the Fourier series coefficient for this rectangular wave function. Okay. Now let's do the same thing that we did in the for the case of uh, continuous time Fourier series. Let's truncate the Fourier series and see what happens. So how do we truncate it? So remember here I have um, K that goes from zero, one, all the way up to N minus one, right? And then this K, AK repeats itself after that. So let's try to truncate it. And let's try to write X hat capital M of N as summation K equals to minus M plus one to capital M JK Omega naught. So, so I recall that XN is given by summation K equals to, let's say minus N, I want to write minus N over two, let's say N is even. No, I, I need n to be, do I need n to be odd or even? Let's let's take n to be odd.
Okay, so Xn is given by this expression, where I have to take k going from minus n minus one over two to k equals n minus one over two. So those are n consecutive times, uh, n consecutive values of k. And this summation will give me xn back. This is under the assumption that n is odd. For even n, you will have to change this values of k in a slight fashion, but it's not very important. As long as you take k, uh, n capital N consecutive values of a k, you will be fine. So, so th this is what we get, but let's say we truncate it to capital M values only. So I'm not going to consider all the values from n minus one over two to n minus one over, minus n minus one over two to n minus one over two. I just compute the values of, I can only, I'll only take the values of K going from minus M plus one to plus M. So this is what I get as an approximation of the signal. Now let's say what happens uh, when you actually plot X hat M versus X N. So this is what X hat, this is X hat one N where you take M equals to one this is x hat 2 n, this is x hat 3 n, and this is x n. Okay, so this is the case when n equals to 9 and n1 is equal to 2. Are these um, graphs that you have available on uh, Carmen? Uh, this is not on Carmen. Uh, this is from the book. This is figure 3. Oh, this is from the book. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So figure 3.18. Uh, this is page 220. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So as you can see, uh, if you take just the first approximation where M is equal to one, you, it doesn't really resemble like a rectangular wave at all. It actually looks like a sinusoidal wave. Uh, when you take m equals to 2, it starts looking a bit more like a square wave, but you see these values are not equal to 0 or not even close to 0. Then you take m equals to 3, you get a much better approximation. So these values are equal to 0. Uh, but you see some variations here in the peak, right? So some oscillations instead of the constant value that you are supposed to get in the original signal. So in the original signal, everything, like when you take M equals to four, you recover the original signal back. Okay, so it's very similar to the case of continuous time signal, because in the continuous time signal, when you started taking the approximation, um, you saw that there was some overshoot and undershoot, and it's the same thing we are observing even in the discrete time signal, but there's one important distinction from the continuous time signal, which is in the continuous time signal, time square wave, AK was non-zero for all K in Z. So basically all the harmonics was present in the signal. Whereas in discrete time signal, your AK takes some values only for K going from, so AK is periodic basically, but the, so in square wave, we only need the values of A0 to AN minus one. So you only need finitely many values. So all the harmonics, because in the discrete time signal, the number of unique harmonics is only capital N. So we only have capital N values of uh, Fourier series coefficients. Whereas that's not the case in continuous time. In continuous time, you can have infinite values of Fourier series coefficients. Okay, I hope this is... Uh, clear, it's a very big distinction. In discrete time, you only have finitely many harmonics, whereas in the continuous time, you can have infinitely many harmonics. 
in the signal. And so um, in the discrete time, uh, you can take finite approximation, but as long as that approximation is large enough, you will recover the original signal. Whereas in continuous time, no matter how many signals you pick, how many finite number of signals you pick, harmonics you pick, uh, you will still have overshoot and undershoot as we had studied in one of the previous classes. It's always going to be the case. Okay. Uh, the next topic that I want to cover is properties of Fourier series. And I'm not going to go over a lot of the properties because it's very similar to the uh, continuous time case. So let me just cover a few of them that are um, non-trivial. So the first property is that of multiplication of signals. So I have Xn, the Fourier series is AK, and I have the signal Yn, whose Fourier series coefficients are BK. Let me multiply the two signals. So if both the signals are periodic with fundamental period capital N, the multiplication is also periodic with fundamental period capital N. Okay, so if you remember in the case of continuous time signals, if you multiply the two signals, then the Fourier series coefficients is actually convolution of the two Fourier series coefficients. Okay, so let me write actually the continuous time case so I can make the connection. Well, let me wait for you to note it down and then I'll write down the continuous time counterpart of this. So in the continuous time, we had x t y t, the Fourier series coefficient c k was summation a l, l goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, b k minus l. Okay, and we did the derivation in the class for this expression. So multiplication in continuous time uh, the Fourier series coefficient would be convolution in the Fourier series space. Now, this is a periodic convolution because you're going all the way from L equals to minus infinity to L equals to plus infinity. The only difference in the discrete time Fourier series is you only have to take N consecutive values of L to conduct the convolution. And this is called periodic convolution. That's just the name of the way you are taking the convolution in the Fourier series domain.
Okay. Any question on this? The derivation is identical to the one for continuous time, so I'm skipping the derivation. Um, you, you can just follow the steps of the continuous time signal and you will see, you'll recognize that you only have to take um, any capital N values of consecutive values of L for conducting this convolution. Let's look at the next signal. So I, 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 I have my, so let's say delay. So I have Xn with the Fourier series given by AK. So if I have Xn minus one, then the Fourier series will be given by E raised to minus JK omega naught AK. More generally, if you have delays of N zero step, then the Fourier series will also get multiplied by e raised to minus j k omega naught. So this of course appears in all the equations, but you get it, uh, you have to multiply it by n naught. This so in your first example, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So in your, in your first example for the x of n minus one, it's negative because we're multiplying by a negative one on the Fourier transform for the, the um, right. exponent. Right, right. Okay, so the, what you're saying then is in the second example um, that N zero is treated the same way as we treat that negative one. Right, that's okay. right, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. The third property, which is the Parseval's relation it's again very similar to the continuous time case Parseval's relation is basically conservation of energy equation. So the energy in the signal is the same as the sum of energy in individual harmonics that comprises the signal. All right. Let's move on to the next part. So these are, this is again a table from the book, table 3.1 from the book. And it basically lists the properties of continuous time Fourier series. Let's say we have two signals, XT and YT with Fourier coefficients given by AK and BK then uh, you have a whole bunch of uh, properties of the Fourier series for various ways of manipulating the signals. So linearity, time shifting, frequency shifting, and so on. And you see the corresponding Fourier series coefficient table on the right side. Okay, so typically in exams, I would provide you with these tables. Uh, you don't really have to remember all this stuff, but it's still good to have some knowledge of where the derivation came, come, comes from. And actually I, I covered quite a few derivations in the class. So hopefully you can 
look at those derivations, do the corresponding derivations for the discrete time case and get this particular table, which is the properties of discrete time Fourier series for discrete time signals. And again, there is a whole bunch of properties. I know it doesn't look good because the picture was very blurry, um, but, but in the exam, I'll give you this table if you need it. Um, and it about the table, I, I've done a bunch of research for other tables online and I found a, a bunch of tables like this that have a, a, all this stuff. Are we allowed to use those too or would you rather us just stick to the book? No, no, no. You can use whatever. I mean, as long as the table is coming from an authentic source, the table is going to be the right. same. Yeah. Okay, it's thank going you. To be the same. So. Okay. Now let's go back to our discussion about the LTI system. Remember, we had started our discussion uh, about chapter three with this particular figure. I have an LTI system. The output is H of S multiplied by E raised to ST where h of s is given by integral h tau e raised to minus s tau d tau minus infinity to infinity, where this is the impulse response. I think this derivation was done in lecture eight or nine. I'm not sure which lecture it was, but probably it was eight or nine. That's when we did this derivation of the LTI system. And in the discrete uh, time domain, we had E raised to, sorry, Z raised to N. And the output was H of Z, Z raised to N, where H of Z was given by summation k goes from minus infinity to infinity hk z raised to minus k so to an lti system you give an exponential input you get an exponential output but the amplitude gets gets uh, changed by H of S or H of Z, depending on whether you are in a continuous time system or a discrete time system. This H is again the impulse response. This H when viewed as a function is called transfer function. And it's also called system function in some books, including the textbook. System function. Okay, so whether someone calls it a transfer function or a system function, it's the same thing. Now let's pick a very specific value of S. Okay, we are going to pick periodic signals. So this is true for any exponential signal. You can take any value of S or any value of Z here and the entire stuff will still hold true. But let's not talk about arbitrary values of S or arbitrary value of Z. Let's talk about periodic inputs to the LTI system. So what kind of periodic input do we have in continuous time? 
let's look at the continuous time system. E raised to J omega T or omega naught T. Well, let me keep it omega T. I get H of J omega E raised to J omega T. So this is just some complex number. And this is of course the periodic signal. And here, H of J omega would be given by minus infinity to infinity, H tau E raised to minus J omega tau D tau. So I have an LTI system. I give it a periodic signal as input. I get a periodic signal as output, which is amplified by a complex number H of J omega. H of J omega when viewed as a function of omega is called the frequency response. Frequency response of the LTI system. Okay, so the only difference between the transfer function and frequency response is in the transfer function, H is a function of S, which is a, which is a arbitrary complex number. Whereas in the frequency response, H is a function of J omega where J omega is of course a very specific complex number. It's the imaginary axis of the, on the complex plane. So that's the only difference. But other than that, there is virtually no difference between the frequency response of the system and the transfer function. They both, the, the frequency response is a specific case of a transfer function where you replace S with J omega. Okay, so for a complex input, for, sorry, for a periodic input, you get a periodic output. Now let's pass some of periodic inputs. So let's say I input some of a k e raised to j k omega naught t. k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. What is the output going to be? First of all, the output will be infinite sum. Remember it's an LTI system. So the superposition principle is applicable because of linearity. So what should I write? What's the output signal going to look like? Someone wants to write in the chat box. Okay, so let's look into, let's look at it. So I have, because of linearity, if I multiply this place by AK, I'll get AK out because of the fact that it's linear. So if I scale the input, the output will get scaled appropriately by the same factor. 
So I'll have a k here. And then e raised to j k omega naught t, that gets converted into h of j omega e raised to j omega t. So that's what, so e raised to j omega t got converted into this. So if I have j k, j k omega naught t, that will be h of j k omega naught. And then I have the usual output. e raised to j k omega naught t. Okay, so I give it a periodic input and I get a periodic output, but, um, but with some changes in the amplitude of the signal. So in the next class, what we are going to do is we will look at this frequency response of the system for a few systems and we'll see what happens to the output of the LTI system when you pass a periodic signal through a LTI system. So that's what we'll do in the next class. And we'll do it both for the continuous time case and for the discrete time case. Okay, so thank you for your attention and please stay back if you want to learn more about geometric series. I'm going to turn off the recording. Thank you.